Hello, Mr. Komsky. Nice to see you. First of all, I wanted to ask you about your personal attitude towards the situation in Ukraine right now. Your position on this war is very much different from the mainstream in the West. Could you tell me who is responsible for the beginning of the invasion? First of all, it's not that different from the West mainstream, not the political leaders. Take a look, for example, at the current issue of uh, Harper's Magazine, major American magazine, the long lead article by two prominent uh, uh, international affairs specialists, Benjamin Schwartz, Christopher Lane, about the same as my position. Uh, who's responsible for the war? Well, for the immediate aggression, of course, Putin is responsible. There's no justification for aggression. On the other hand, if you look back farther, gee, Schwartz and Lane give a good history of this. It's been understood for 30 years, ever since Clinton, by the top level of the uh, U.S. diplomatic corps, including the current CIA director, his predecessors, uh, most of the political scientists in the 1990s and since they have been strongly warning Washington that expanding NATO to Russia's border is in violation of firm promises to Gorbachev is reckless and provocative. And they have made it very clear the current CIA director, William Burns, a Russia specialist, was particularly explicit about this, that in all the years he spent in Russia as an ambassador, he never met a single person from right to left who didn't agree that Ukraine joining NATO was an absolute unacceptable red line. That's Yeltsin, Gorbachev, uh, liberal critics of uh, the Putin regime all agree on that. That's been understood by Washington for more than 30 years, and the overwhelming political class has supported it. Well, they went ahead anyway, and uh, that's background you can't overlook. Doesn't justify the invasion, nothing justifies aggression. But it's uh, part of the background you can't overlook. This went on to the last minute, as late as January, February 2022, just before the invasion. The Russians were, Lavrov, Putin were still saying very explicitly the crucial issue is Ukraine joining NATO, that we cannot accept any more than Yeltsin or Gorbachev. Yes, but you agree with the fact that Ukraine was not supposed to join NATO in the foreseeable future, right? There were even guarantees given to the Russian government that Ukraine would not become a member of the alliance. In particular, as I understand, this is what Chancellor Schultz was telling Vladimir Putin not long before the start of the war. I mean, that it could not happen. No one was planning to get Ukraine into NATO. Uh, if you think that you're talking to the wrong person, you ought to be talking to the director of the CIA, a diplomatic corps, or practically all political scientists in the United States who don't agree with you. So talk to them. No, no, no. I'm just interested in your position. I happen to, I happen to, I happen to think that they're right, but it's pointless to talk to me about it when this is virtually unanimous opinion. Uh, to say I'm in the position that George Bush the second, not the first, when he took in 2008 saying Ukraine must join NATO, he was blocked at that point by France and Germany, but the US is powerful enough so that they couldn't prevent the official statement from saying it's just a matter of time. If uh, China were to create a huge military alliance, highly aggressive uh, and say uh, to Mexico, you're going to join, but even if it's not now, you're going to join pretty soon. And meanwhile, working to integrate Mexico into the Chinese military alliance. 
The U.S. would not tolerate that for one second. And the U.S. would invade? Wouldn't, wouldn't even get, get to that. If Mexico ever, ever dreamt of doing anything like that, it'd be finished, and you know that perfectly well. Look what happened when Cuba legally, perfectly legally, uh, requested defense against ongoing U.S. terrorist attacks. U.S. practically destroyed the world. Of course, Cuba and Russia were legally right, as the State Department agreed. They were legally in the right. U.S. actions were totally illegal, but nobody was going to tolerate it. Я прочитала ваше недавнее интервью, господин Хомский. I read your recent interview. And among other things, you say that, quote, Ukraine is not a free actor. They are dependent on what the U.S. determines. End of quote. You probably know that this is exactly what Russian propaganda says. Sorry. It's the opposite. Sorry. It is the opposite of what Russia propaganda says. What I said is, Ukraine must make its, has every right to make its own decisions. We don't have anything to say about that. But we happen to live in a world, and in this world, power systems have effects on what others do. You can pretend they don't if you want to pretend you're living on Mars. But in this world, what the United States insists has a big effect on what everyone does. That's a fact about the world, and that's what you quoted. But you didn't quote the next sentence, which says, Ukraine has every right to do anything it wants to do. However, if it crosses U.S. demands, it'll be in trouble, just like anyone else in the world. Who... And what are the demands of the U.S. in this case? I mean, what, in your opinion, does the U.S. get from this conflict, from this war? What does the U.S. gain from the war? Yes, what is the interest of Washington? Well, there's a lot of interest, but some of them are discussed by leading U.S. strategic analysts, like Anthony Cordesman, one of the most respected conservative uh, uh, political uh, strategic analysts. He points out that the U.S. is getting a tremendous bargain from the war at a small fraction of the colossal U.S. military budget, it is able to severely degrade the military forces of its only military opponent. And as Cordesman points out, that's an incredible bargain. Now, I'm not saying that that's the motive, but it's a fact. The rest of the world is suffering from the war. Europe is declining, may move to deindustrialization. Much of the South is uh, suffering from a uh, cutoff of uh, reduction of uh, badly needed food. Whole world is suffering badly from the fact that we're facing a potential threat of nuclear war and reversing the limited steps towards uh, doing with something about the climate. But one country is gaining enormously. It's called the United States. Again, I'm not saying that's the motive, but that's a fact. Uh, I already mentioned the military aspect much more. Uh, U.S. fossil fuel companies are don't even know what to do with their profits, literally. Profits are booming because Europe is spending 10 times as much on U.S. liquefied natural gas as it did from Russia. Uh, geopolitically, the U.S. has gained enormously. Uh, instead of Europe, there's been an issue all throughout the Cold War as to whether Europe would move in an independent direction in world affairs. De Gaulle, uh, Lily Brandt, uh, Genscher, others become or what Gorbachev called a common European. The U.S. is strongly opposed to that. It wants an Atlanticist system run by the United States through NATO. Russia gave the United States a tremendous gift on a silver platter, handed Europe over to the United States, undermined the uh, idea of a 
independent Europe and an independent Eurasia. It's a wonderful gift. So the US happens to be gaining enormously from the war. Everyone else is suffering from it. Is that the motive? Not necessarily. There's decent motives too, like helping defend a country that's under brutal, vicious aggression. That's a motive too, but not much of one. If you look at history, the United States has never taken that position when countries under attack by its own allies or by itself for that matter. Remember that the United States is the most aggressive country in the world. Violent aggression. Uh, in recent years, uh, NATO has attacked Serbia, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, devastating consequences, no credible pretext. Happens to be a fact about the world. So if you talk about moral motives, you have to qualify it by the fact that it doesn't affect policy. They nevertheless may exist. So if you want to look at the mixture of motives. So just to clarify, what if the U.S. did not help Ukraine? Surely Ukraine would be occupied by the Russian Federation. Good. So tell that to people who are opposed to defending Ukraine. But you don't have to tell it to me because I've always strongly, emphatically, clearly said that there's every reason to defend, help Ukraine defend itself. That doesn't change what I just said. Again, I'm just trying to understand your position. So you are saying that the U.S. has an interest in this war. After the elections in the U.S., what changes in your opinion? After which election? After the 2024 U.S. presidential election. The presidential election. Well, there's a, if the Republicans win, chances are that uh, there's a strong, you can read in the New York Times this morning, front page story about how the base of the Republican Party, the popular base, is opposed to supporting, to spending, to supporting Ukraine. It's not because they're isolationist. They want to concentrate on a war with China, which is much more dangerous. It's another topic altogether. So if the Republicans win the election, chances are aid to Ukraine will decline and will start moving towards uh, a terminal war, which will destroy the human species with China. Wow. If the Democrats win, it'll probably be a continuation of the present policy. What's your prediction? Who will win? Who would win what? Who will win the election? The Democrats or Republicans? What is more likely? There's no way of predicting. It's about, if you look at the polls, it's about 50-50. Yeah, absolutely. So you have mentioned that the brutal wars that United States has conducted in different parts of the world, and again, quote your words, Russia is fighting more humanely than the U.S. did in Iraq, you say. That's not my words, I'm sorry. That's oh, it's not the quote, I'm sorry. That's the words of the interviewer. Yes, absolutely, you are right. There was no quote sign, I'm sorry about that. But do you agree with this conclusion of the reporter that you think that Russia is fighting more humanely? Would you agree with this? That's the way Russian-style propagandists invert things for propaganda purposes. The fact is that, as U.S. and British military officials have pointed out, Russia has not, to their surprise, fought the war as harshly as the U.S. and Britain do. Now, that's rever inverted by the propagandists to say Russia's fighting more humanely, okay? Standard, apparatchik-style propaganda, okay? But the fact of the matter is U.S. and British military officials are correct. Did anybody visit Baghdad while the U.S. was carrying out its attack? Does anybody visit Kiev? Well, ask yourself. Yes, but did anybody visit Mariupol and Bucha and Izum? No, but they didn't visit the brain. Did they visit Baghdad? But does it make a difference? I mean... Uh... Look, be serious. The, you know, Baghdad in Mariupol, there was a bitter battle. Nobody visited. 
Nobody visited Fallujah when the US was wiping it out either. But the crucial point is the when the US and Britain go after a country, they go right to the jugular, destroy communications, transportation, uh, energy, uh, right away. Now, Russia's fought a bitter, brutal, vicious war, but it hasn't done that. Life goes on in Kiev. Western Ukraine has been harmed, but not seriously. Russia has not even destroyed, attacked these supply lines. So it's a brutal, vicious war, but it's not at the level of the way the US and Britain go to war. But, Mr. Kamsky, I don't want you to think that I'm supporting propaganda or something like that. But wouldn't you agree that when you compare the American war in Iraq to what Russia is doing in Ukraine, you know, people jump to conclusions that you are trying to justify Russia's actions? People who can't think might say that. If I say, if a German, if a Nazi apologist says the Iraq war uh, is, if a Nazi, a critic of Nazism says, the Iraq war is not as terrible as the Nazis. That's not a justification of the Iraq war. Anybody can understand that. When I say the similarly that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is violent and murderous, but it's not at the level of the Iraq war, it is not a justification of the invasion of Ukraine. The logic is very simple. But why would you need to compare? Why? Notice when I compare. I compare when people say, as American propaganda does, that the invasion of Iraq, of Ukraine is something absolutely unique. We cannot tolerate one country attacking another. Uh, we can't. We have all kind of high flight, uh, you know, wonderful rhetoric about our commitment to international law and so on. Then in that context, I say what the rest of the world says. You're a total hypocrite and a liar. Your own wars are even worse. Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. How would you describe this personality and this leader? Well, you could ask George Bush II, who looked he into... He saw his soul, yes, I remember. Putin's eyes saw his soul and saw he was good. Or you can read the people now who are reading tea leaves about how he's a man, total paranoid lunatic. Or you can look at the facts. Well, we have the facts. We know what his positions were. I wouldn't want to have, I don't, uh, he wouldn't be a friend of mine. I think he's a rotten person, like anybody who carries out violent aggression. But uh, what his personality is, is not my business. He's a kleptomania. He's a amassed enormous wealth for himself. He runs a harsh authoritarian state. Uh, why should I have any uh, comment about him? And he's carrying out a brutal war. But that doesn't change the facts about the immense hypocrisy and the lies and the, f and the fabrications and the suppression of crucial facts. That's also correct. How would you describe or how would you see the punishment for the invasion for Vladimir Putin and others responsible? I think that anybody who commits aggression should be subjected to the International Criminal Court. Anybody, that's George Bush II, Obama, uh, Clinton, Putin, all of them should how do you see the resolution of the war in Ukraine? Can you see a peace deal? What could a peace deal look like? Well, actually, there are careful proposals like the one I just described in the lead article of Harper's today. Uh, let's be clear about it. It's a crucial issue. Either it will be a negotiated diplomatic settlement or it will not. That's logic. Can't argue with that. Uh, suppose it's not a diplomatic settlement. Two possibilities. One, one side or the other will capitulate. Two, it'll be a stalemate. It'll be like Bakhmut. They'll just wear each other down like the First World War. Uh, Ukraine will probably be destroyed. 
uh, Russia will be severely damaged. If suppose that one side or the other capitulates, which side is it going to be? It's not going to be Russia. Russia has ultimate weapons. If they were ever facing defeat, which is unlikely, they would simply escalate. They'd start moving to attacking the supply lines, get into conflicts with NATO. And pretty soon we'd be at a terminal nuclear war. So Russia's not going to capitulate. We don't want Ukraine to capitulate. We don't want a stalemate. That leaves one option, a diplomatic resolution. Well, what would it look like? It's pretty clear what it has to look like. Russia is not going to abandon its control of Sevastopol, which it's held since 1783. It's only warm water port. So Russia is going to maintain that. What about Crimea? Well, the right answer would be to carry out an internationally sponsored referendum in Crimea to see what people want. According to the mainstream American journals, like Foreign Affairs, the main establishment journal, Crimeans apparently want to be annexed by Russia. Well, we can find out by a referendum. If that's what it turns out to be, okay. Some kind of land bridge between Crimea and Russia, uh, some form of autonomy within a Ukrainian federation for the uh, Donbass region, roughly Minsk, the Minsk arrangements, and a guarantee that Ukraine will not be in the hostile military alliance. Those are the rough outlines of what could be a diplomatic settlement. Can it be reached? There's only one way to find out. Try. The U.S. position is we must not try. U.S. position is no negotiations. This is not the time for negotiations. Uh, we have to continue the war to severely weaken Russia. That's a ghastly gamble with the fate of Ukraine. It's saying, let's hope that if Putin, this mad dog lunatic, is facing defeat, He'll quietly pack up his bags, slink away, go home to oblivion. He won't use the weapons he has to obliterate Ukraine. That's an incredible gamble with the fate of Ukrainians. I don't accept it. If you do, that's up to you. That's the... But again, you're saying that this gamble is coming from the U.S., but actually this is the Ukrainian position. They cannot give up a millimeter, a meter of their territory. They say this out loud all the time, that after the atrocities committed on their land, they just cannot agree and accept the peace plan that you just mentioned. That's why I have said repeatedly, I put it in capital letters, Ukraine has to make its own decisions. So this is their decision. But I am talking about the United States, Europe, uh, the rest of the world. They have to make decisions too. The U.S. position is we must not have negotiations. We must continue the war to severely weaken Russia, even if it turns out to destroy Ukraine. I'm not That is separate from Ukraine. If Ukraine wants, I laid out the basic structure. I'll say it again. Either there are negotiations or there aren't. If there aren't negotiations, it's either a stalemate in which Ukraine will be devastated or one side or the other capitulates and it won't be Russia because they can escalate the war without limit. So if Ukraine wants to face that situation, if Ukraine wants to invade Crimea, which is probably militarily impossible and where the population probably doesn't want it, that's Ukraine's decision, not up to me. But even if there is this stalemate, if they sign a peace deal, Ukraine and Russia, let's imagine, who guarantees that there will not be any other invasions? There has not been one hint of any other invasion. For what about Georgia? I was just going to say, except for the official red lines, Georgia and Ukraine. And in fact, in the case of Georgia, 
what happened is when the Georgians invaded the breakaway territories, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, Russia intervened, drove them back, and did not occupy Georgia. It kept to the exact positions that they were saying that a break that uh, they will support Russian oriented areas, but they will not accept Georgia and Ukraine to enter NATO. Otherwise, Georgia can do what it likes, which is what happened. And there has not been one word in the record, try to find it, about threatening anyone else. The issue has been for 30 years, Georgia and Ukraine in NATO. And uh, that's what, I'm not, there's no justification of Russia here. It's a brutal autocratic state. But let's keep the fact, not just reiterate crazed American propaganda. No, I was still in Tbilisi in August 2008, and Georgia had not invaded South Ossetia. It was a part of an eastern part of Georgia, and also the Russian army was right at the border of Georgia. Russia essentially invaded Georgia, and it had been proven. We have keep to the facts. Georgia invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and the Russians reacted. It was not Abkhazia. Russia opened a second front. But, but that's what happened. It was a harsh murderous invasion russia reacted maybe they shouldn't maybe not no it was not a murderous invasion it is russia occupying georgia russia is occupying abhazia and south Ossetia. so they are the breakaway provinces which georgia attacked but russia did not move to in Georgia didn't attack abhazia i mean we can keep arguing but you don't have to argue because the facts are uncontroversial. It began with the Georgian attack on South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Now, you can say the Russians shouldn't have reacted or they should have reacted, but that's what happened. But OK, we are talking about Ukraine. So one of the reasons the Kremlin is naming as a motivation for the invasion of Ukraine is not to. They are saying that they are denatifying Ukraine that there is a denatification of Ukraine, that there are Nazis in Kiev. How would you comment on that? That's what negotiations and diplomacy is about. What negotiations and diplomacy are about are taking the issues that are significant, putting the others, eliminating and disregarding the others. The one that is significant is the one the Russians have always emphasized, membership in NATO and some form of autonomy for the Donbass region, the Minsk proposals, the, the denazification is a Russian business. You can disregard it in, in negotiations. That's what negotiations and diplomacy are about. I wanted to ask you about the situation in Russia. You know perfectly well that Vladimir Putin is a brutal leader. I cannot be there in Russia. My colleagues and my friends Thousands, hundreds of thousands of Russian citizens cannot be there. What can be the way out for Russians? I mean, if you have thought about that, what do you think? Who Russians can rely on if the West is a hypocrite in your terms, in your opinion? In the terms of the world, that's why the whole global South is ridiculing these pretensions of high principle and so on. And they've been victims of it all, their, all through history. They know hypocrisy when they can see it. I said what I said about Russia, I will repeat. Putin is a harsh autocrat, kleptomaniac, enriched himself and his friends, imposed a harsh, brutal system in Russia. That's the fact. Unfortunately, it's a fact around much of the world. And all the regions that the U.S. dominates, that tends to be the fact as well. Well, these are problems that have to be dealt with mainly internally in the country. The, uh, 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 the Rush, Russia has to come to terms internally with its long, harsh, cruel history. Nobody can do that. So right now, we talk about the global South, the interests of Russia, the interests of the United States, the motivation of different sides. But every day, we can see how children are being killed in Ukraine. Cities and towns are totally destroyed. Isn't it the time to just face reality and say, this is the aggressor, 
This is the victim. We need to defend Ukraine because it means a lot to everyone. Do you support this position? I'm sorry, say the position again. The position is, let's name what's black and white, perpetrator and victim. Russia is an aggressor. Ukraine I, is a victim. Do you want me to say it again in super letters? No, I mean, do you think that if we all support this position, that it would help with the resolution of this terrible war? It is very easy for us, for you in your safe position, me in my safe position, to say Russia is evil, let's uh, let Ukraine win the war. Easy to say that if you want to destroy Ukraine, because think through what you're saying. Think through what you're saying. Russia is not going to capitulate. They have ways to escalate the war. And we all know that they could raise it to the level of the attack on Iraq. They can raise it to higher levels. So what you're saying is, let's feel self-righteous and consign Ukraine to destruction. That's your position. But why do you think Russia has lost Kherson, for example? Russia could not occupy Kiev during the first days of war, right? Russia could not occupy Kherson and it has lost part of its occupied territories. If you're willing to take a chance that Russia will capitulate, go ahead. But you're the worst enemy of Ukraine I have ever met. Because you're saying, let's hope that Russia will capitulate and not use its more advanced weapons to essentially destroy Ukraine. I'm not saying that, I'm asking. I'm not saying that we need to wait for Russia to destroy Ukraine or Russia to capitulate. I'm saying we've seen several times how Russia has taken steps back. And why did it happen? Why don't we keep arming Ukraine so that Ukraine will defeat Russia? That's what you're saying? I'm just saying that, why do you think that Ukraine cannot win the war? Because I live in the world and I can see the facts of the world, not dreams. The facts of the world are that Russia has unlimited means of destruction. We all know that. You know it. I know it. Now, you're gambling with Ukraine by saying, well, maybe if Russia faces defeat, Putin, the mad dog, will pack his bags slink away to oblivion and not use the weapons he has to destroy Ukraine. You want to take that gramble with Ukraine? Your business. Okay, I don't. Okay, Putin do you still not... Why hasn't Putin used tactical nuclear weapons yet? I'm just wondering, doesn't he understand that if he uses nuclear weapons, it would be devastating for Russia as well? It will certainly be that. But if you're willing to gamble... I'm not insisting on risking anything. I just want this war to think end. Think through what you're saying. A lot is at stake. You're saying, let's try to get Ukraine to win the war and, get, and we'll gamble that Putin will not use the weapons he has, but will just go to suicide. That's what you're saying. I'm not willing... Yes, that is exactly what you're saying. No, I'm not saying I'm, that. I'm asking the question. I'm a journalist. I need to ask the questions. What are you what are you calling for? What are you calling for? I'm asking the questions about your position and I'm trying to use the counter arguments. My position is very explicit. I do not want the United States, my country, the one I have something to say about, not Ukraine. They do what they want. I do not want the United States to refuse a diplomatic settlement in order to severely weaken Russia, no matter what the fate of Ukraine and the fate of the world. I'm not in favor of that. Mr. Komsky, thank you very much for this conversation. It was really interesting. We operated in Russia for 12 years and the government tried to get rid of us three times. We had to leave, forced out of the country by new repressive laws after the first week of the war. Our freedom crushed by the authorities. We survived, started working from Europe, and now we are watched by millions of people every day. There is no other independent news channel in Russian. We have now decided to tell the truth about Russia in English as well. 
so that you could get news about Russia, the war in Ukraine, and Russian society directly from the source. We want to tell you firsthand what is really happening in Russia. Subscribe to TV Rain Newsroom on YouTube and let's take a look at our future together.